Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mara Jean Tilley and I have the privilege of heading up the Garvin Research Foundation, which is the marketing and fundraising arm of the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. I'm delighted to be your MC for today's session of Bite Size Science, the last in this series for 2020. It's heartwarming to see so many supporters, donors, partners for the future, as well as some newbies in the Zoom room. Welcome to you all. Before we kick off, I'm honoured to pay my respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which the Garvin Institute and St Vincent's Hospital are located. We recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, to today's topic. Dr. Kate Patterson, one of our most talented scientists and biomedical animators. The inner workings of living cells are an abstract concept to most of us. When trying to visualize the inside of a human cell, most of us will think back to a black and white static image of something that we saw in a science textbook in high school. Yet in reality, all components inside a cell are constantly in motion, bustling with life and activity. Dr. Kate Patterson creates animations using scientific data, blending storytelling with the tools of art and design. Her work presents biological processes as accurately as possible, but in a dynamic and engaging way. And that is to say, there's a little bit of creative license that needs to be applied. Many of you will have been through our Garvin building and the Kinghorn Cancer Centre on a tour, and you may have experienced firsthand the Garvin Weizmann Cell Observatory on the top floor of the Kinghorn Cancer Centre, this, this part of our partnership with the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And the Cell Observatory offers an immersive 3D visualisation experience that has allowed us to rethink how we present cellular education through biomedical tools. Due to the nature of Bite Size Science, we will not have a live Q&A at the end of today's session, but we will be displaying three commonly asked questions and asking you as the audience to vote on your preferred queue. So please do participate. If you have questions that arise throughout the presentation that are not addressed through the Q&A, please do send them through along with your survey results. Uh, include your name and your email address and somebody from the team will be sure to get back to you with a response as soon as is possible. Now, my great pleasure is to introduce Dr. Kate Patterson. Kate creates animations using authentic scientific data and blends storytelling with the tools of art and design. She focuses on creating multimedia animations and immersive visualization experiences. Dr. Patterson was a veterinarian before completing her PhD in cancer biology right here, virtually anyway, at the Garvin Institute. It was during her time working on her PhD that she discovered her passion for communicating science. And in 2012, she was awarded an Inspiring Australia grant to produce 3D animations on cancer and epigenetics. And just some of that work can be seen on level eight of the Garvin building. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. It's really exciting to have you here. I'm gonna kick off with, with a question if I may. So you started your career as a vet. What inspired you to then move on to bio, biomedical research and then to education, biomedical education? Yeah, so I guess I was inspired by my patients as a vet. Um, I really wanted to know more about cancer and why certain dogs got certain types of cancer and other breeds of dogs were predisposed to getting different types of cancer. And so I came to the Garvin to do a PhD in molecular biology to try and uncover some of those secrets, but also to learn how to do research to, with, with the view to take it back into the veterinary industry. Um, but I guess I became very involved in Garvin and also in the field of science communication. And I realized during, during my PhD that communicating your work is a critical part of being a scientist. And I guess for me, 
making visuals and explaining research rather than actually doing research was um, probably where my skills were a little bit stronger. And so, I, yeah, I guess I found taking something abstract and invisible and making it into something that people can actually see was, was really satisfying. And I guess it's, it's creating those moments of understanding that, that really drive me. Fantastic. Well, we're very excited to have you with us today. So, Kate, I'm going to hand over to you and I'll come back in time for the questions. Thank Excellent. you so Thank much. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, as, um, as Mara Jean said, I, I guess I've been at Garvin now for over 15 years and I've worn various professional hats during that time. And now I am a biomedical animator within the Garvin Research Foundation, which means I make animations to showcase and explain some of Garvin's important research endeavors, which aims to make the science more accessible to more people and, and also more memorable. So we have powerful microscopes and advanced technologies that scientists use all the time to make new discoveries about our bodies and about health and disease. But due to scale or resolution and complexity, these instruments may not give us the full picture or often just a tiny piece of the puzzle that scientists put together to work out a more complete picture. And I guess animations are similar in that they bring together many different sources of information to show how molecules look and behave are things that can't be seen by any other means. And in this way, animations make the invisible visible. This picture is from one of my animations that shows gene transcription. And you can see lots of tiny blobs all joined together. And this is a fairly conventional way to show molecules with each of the blobs representing a single element in the chemical structure of that molecule. And together, these blobs form structures like DNA that you can see I've colored pink here that is sneaking through this um, protein that I've colored blue and purple. This is a protein called RNA polymerase and it's responsible for transcribing DNA into RNA. The RNA you can see here in yellow and it looks a bit like a comb with each of the teeth of the comb resent, uh, representing one molecule, one nucleotide, sorry, or one letter that corresponds to the DNA code. And you might be able to see that the blue protein, the RNA polymerase, grabs onto the DNA at, at the start of a gene. Um, and as the DNA goes through it, the double helix is actually split so that the DNA code is exposed and then the RNA can be formed. In real life, this happens at about 30 bases per second. So this is an example where using animation to slow down that rate, can really, we can really see what's going on. So I'm gonna show you now a some scenes from um, some of my animations, so you can see um, how, some of the, how, how some of them actually look. Here you can see some pancreatic cancer cells forming at about 2,000 times magnification and start to divide out of control. If we zoom in and look inside the nucleus of one of these cells, you could see DNA and some of these proteins are colored purple but that are responsible for making tiny chemical changes to the DNA that can affect which genes are on and which genes are on, are off, sorry. This tagging of the DNA is called methylation and is something that can go wrong in cancer as well as many other diseases. Here you can see one strand of DNA with methylation shown as bright particles. You can also follow the DNA sequence and corresponding methylation pattern at the top. This animation shows that bone is not just a scaffold for muscles and nerves, but is a living dynamic organ home to many, many different types of cells. These are stem cells that will enter the bloodstream destined to mature into new red blood cells. The tiny space between these stem cells and the bone matrix is also extremely dynamic and packed with important molecules. Animation gives us a closer look at the crowded spaces inside our bodies, in blood vessels and in the nucleus of cells which are packed with DNA and also with many other molecules that help to pack two meters of DNA into every cell. 
Here we see DNA wrapped around just one nucleosome. It's packed tightly and preventing access to the DNA, but other parts of the DNA are open and available so that genes can be active. Here, gene transcription has been slowed down 30 times so you can see the RNA being produced inside the blue protein that transcribes DNA into RNA. This is the first step of creating proteins, the building blocks of our bodies. So now I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the steps that it takes to make an animation. And the first step, sometimes the longest one, is finding the story and then doing the research. The story may come from a new research discovery or be about a well-reported concept, but it's notoriously difficult to explain and understand using other methods. Because the animations are made using authentic scientific data, the information is brought together from lots of different sources and it can include microscope images, gene expression data, published scientific literature, and something I never take for granted, which is the luxury of working really closely with scientists at Garvin who can inform and re-inform the, the animation process so that I can make sure that the animations are as accurate as possible. The other resource I rely heavily on can be seen in this picture on the right. It's called the Protein Data Bank. And it's essentially a publicly available library of molecular structures. So when a scientist publishes a paper about the shape or structure of a protein or a molecule, the information is uploaded to this library. As an, as an animator, I can then access this library and import the 3D shapes directly into my animation software, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So there's some... Um, this is a summary of the process of creating an animation. And the first step is really writing out the story. And once that's done, I start to sketch the storyboard. This lays out all of the main elements in each of the scenes and helps to plan how the molecules will look and move and interact with each other. The next step is that I jump into the 3D software and I use Maya with a plugin called Molecular Maya. Um, the plugin was created actually by a fantastic group in Harvard with much of the coding um, actually done by an Australian scientist based in Adelaide. Um, in, in Maya, the molecules can be rigged with a skeleton, for example, that then I can, I can make move um, or by simulation. And then just like a theatre, I can set up cameras to capture the action uh, and add lighting and colours that are then added to the scenes and then rendered out one frame at a time. And each of these frames can take up to an hour or an hour and a half to render. And at 30 frames per second of animation, you can sort of get a sense of how long these things take to do. So those frames are then taken into After Effects where they're composited together and edited with voiceover and sounds uh, to make the final version of the animation. One of the things I really enjoy about the process of making an animation is finding the right balance between artistry and accuracy. So the animations are driven by science, but they also blend storytelling with the tools of art and design, which is what Mara Jean was, was explaining before. So design decisions are made all the time that really navigate this treacherous path. One of the things that's more on the art side than on the science side is the use of colour. Molecules, of course, are so tiny that they don't really have a visible colour like this at, at that scale. So the use of colour is really up to the animator. And I use colour to help tell the story. And in this case, for example, I used it to differentiate the parts of the scene. So the DNA is coloured differently to the protein, which is coloured differently to the RNA. Wearing my art hat, I aim to design the animation so that they're bright and engaging and interesting to look at. But wearing my scientist hat, I have to be careful that none of these artistic elements can change the message or give the wrong impression about something that's going on. Uh, and one of the things that people often ask me when I've shown them an animation is how can I get inside? How can I see what's happening behind the DNA or around the whole environment? And this has really sparked a new chapter of work, which has been exploring ways that we can use immersive visualization to take people to places that they can't physically get to, like the inside of a cell. So we're doing that in a few different ways. 
Firstly, with 360 degree animations that you can watch on YouTube and also view in 360 degrees using an accessible headset like a Google Cardboard that you can see on the left here, and you're just your smartphone. But we've also developed some more interactive virtual reality experiences uh, called Cell Explorer. And this was designed for HTC Vive and Oculus Quest, which are high end head mounted displays and they've got handheld controllers. And the handheld controllers allow you to grab and manipulate molecules like build your own DNA and activate gene expression within the nucleus. We've also got an immersive visualization dome at Garvin called the Cell Observatory. Uh, and this is so small groups can experience the animations together. And, and it really helps to facilitate conversations with scientists um, and each other in, in a more social setting. So I'm going to show you a, a short video now, which will just explain a little bit about how some of these immersive visualizations work. And so you can go onto the Garvin webpage to see these animations in full and also learn a little bit more about the virtual reality we have. Uh, so I just wanted to also acknowledge um, the people who have helped support me through the creation of these animations. So the Garvin Research Foundation, particularly the communications team, the, um, the Institute and the specific scientific advisors that I've had for each of the animations and also my collaborators at UNSW Art and Design who have um, been instrumental in the development of the virtual reality experiences. Well, Kate, I think it's fair to say that that is so cool and just so beautiful to look at, but also so interesting from a science education perspective. We're going to bring up the poll questions, but while, while we do that, how long does it take to create a single animation? Perhaps use the pancreatic cancer cells animation as an example for us. So the pancreatic cancer cell animation has a special place in my heart because it was the very first animation that I did. And so I think for that, partly because of that reason, it took me longer than it, it would now, but that particular animation took me 12 months. Um, but I didn't know much about the, the whole process from, from the, the start of that. Um, now to create that same thing um, would probably take half that time. So I would say three to six months for a, a, a three minute animation. And is 12 months the longest it's ever taken to build yes. Lots of animations? Yes. Fantastic. Now tell me, how has COVID-19 affected your work? I mean, the, the most obvious impact, I guess, is that we've not been able to welcome visitors into the Garvin building um, and presumably uh, headsets and whatnot uh, are going to be tricky while we navigate the, the virus until we've got a readily accessible vaccine. What, what's it been like for you? Yeah, so my actual work per se um, involves myself and my computer. So in that sense, I'm, I'm very lucky it can happen anywhere. And the software these days is great and you don't need really super power machines to drive the, the, the software. So I can just work at home most of the time, which is amazing. Um, I do miss the interaction with scientists that you get on a daily basis when you're in the building. Um, that's, you know, it's just a little bit more challenging to get feedback and to show people things and to discuss things. Obviously then the execution of the animations and the way we engage people has changed a lot. Uh, and we've had to pivot quite substantially in the last six months away from the use of headsets. 
Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the latest project we've been working on is actually converting some of those decisions about how to use gaming to educate people and to engage people back onto a screen-based version. So people can still access the information, but um, don't have to rely so heavily on it on a headset. It hopefully will come back soon and we'll be able to re-engage in that way. But yeah, we've just, everyone's in the same boat. Adaptation. That's right. It sounds exciting anyway, and a nice addition to, to all of the beautiful assets that you've already created. I'm just going to check in and see how we're going on the poll questions and just remind everyone, if you haven't already got your up, oh, there we go. We've, the votes have come through. All right, the people have spoken. Uh, okay, so Kate, the first question is, how does someone become a biomedical animator? Yes, this is a question that I am asked a lot. And I think uh, the proportion of my work that is spent on um, speaking to people about careers compared to making animations is, is yeah, it's quite high. People are obviously very interested in this, in this area. Um, and there's no very quick answer, unfortunately. So um, in Australia, there are no dedicated programs that train you how to become a biomedical animator. There are around the world, in Europe and in US in particular, um, and in Canada. Um, so you can go and do one of those programs um, and which will train you as a highly um, skilled biomedical animator. The, the alternative in the, the route that I took, I guess, is to start to develop your own portfolio and learn the skills of um, animating through online courses and um, you know through universities and things. Um, then associate yourself with an institute or with some scientists that you can animate for um, and build up the portfolio that way. Mm, fantastic, thanks Kate. How do you decide what story to tell? I mean, it's a really good question actually, because there, you know, we've got, more than 700 people at the Garvin Institute, they're all doing some incredible work. How do you pick between them? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, there, there is too much to be animated versus how many animators there are. There is yeah, so many things that we could show. Um, I think one of the important things is to pick a story where the, the, the concepts and the structures that you animate are fairly well researched. Um, but yet they still need to be interesting and at the forefront of research. So the reason why I, I would like to pick something that's already known about or the structures are resolved, for example, is because it's such a time commitment and, and investment in making an animation. You don't want to make a story about something that's going to change or that you don't have enough complete information about to really tell a, a true story. Um, so that's part of it. Um, another part of it is interest so interest from uh, scientists you know if it's something that is coming up again and again it's difficult to explain and, and and people really want a visual to explain it then that's um, an obvious one and also that can come from different audiences uh, so students general public audiences health professionals they may have different challenges that animation can can help so the audience drives it a little bit as well um, and funding you know the wherever the funding comes from um, often gets the animation unfortunately yeah yeah just like science unfortunately. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so how do how do your animations help our scientists do their work yeah that's um an interesting one as well people often ask that question and it helps in a, a number of ways um I guess one of the ways that I believe is the most valuable is it actually facilitates conversations. And so it gives everybody this tangible, um, common thing to refer to, to talk about, and it brings people together. And that can really accelerate the research. It can also help to generate new research questions. So I remember a time I was in Boston and, and showed some animations to a group um, who were working on epigenetics. And they've been working on epigenetics for... Sorry, sorry Kate, what's epigenetics? Oh, sorry. Epigenetics is sort of the layer above the DNA code. So the different things that are added to um, DNA that can control gene expression 
Um, so one of the examples I showed in the animation was methylation, that little tiny chemical tag added to DNA can really affect which genes are on and which genes are off. That's just one of the many different types of epigenetic modifications that, that can um, occur in our cells and go wrong in disease. So I was talking with these um, scientists and showing them the structures of some of the molecules they have worked on for a number of years. And it wasn't until they had actually seen it and seen it move and interact with other molecules that they suddenly were like, oh my goodness, that's how does the molecule actually ever fit together? It sort of gives this a new insight, if you like, um, into work that they, they have been working on for a long time. Amazing, amazing. Now, I believe recently you had a scientist join you from the Weizmann Institute in Israel to learn how to do what you do. How, what was that experience like? Oh, it was fantastic. Ophir, um, who, yeah, was a physicist, actually, came from Weizmann to, uh, to learn how to do animation. And uh, first of all, she overcame the challenges of English as a second language, then overcame the challenges of having a background in physics and not biology, and learned how to do animation. She was absolutely um, amazing. And uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the, the strengthening that connection between the Garvin and um, Weizmann Institutes as well through, through her ex experience being here. She didn't come in the best year, unfortunately, being, uh, being COVID, but she, yeah, she managed very well. Amazing. And so is she taking back that learning to the Weizmann now to bring that capability to their Teams. That's right. Yes. Yes. She's going back to work in their scientific services group um, as, as the primary animator. Amazing. That's really exciting. Well, Kate, I could keep asking you questions all afternoon. It's been really inspiring. Um, hopefully uh, in, in the follow up, we can just remind everyone of where to find your beautiful animations on the Garvin website. Um, if not, then we'll make sure that you get that link in the follow up email with the recorded version of today's session. As per usual, I would be so grateful if everybody in the Zoom room today would give their full and frank feedback. It's been a wild year. We've been doing our virtual seminar series since pretty early on in the pandemic. The Bite Size series is, as you know, a newer effort to try to provide the latest and most exciting Garvin research in a way that people can participate on their lunch breaks or um, by taking a short break out of their, their daily commitments. So please let us know what you think. Positive, negative, we want it all. We do believe that we will continue to work this way beyond uh, 2020 with or without COVID-19. We've certainly got some feedback that there are people who can't get to Sydney who love to participate in this forum. So send through your thoughts. Our sincerest thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, if you are motivated by today, please tell your friends about the Garvin Institute, share the recording of the video, uh, tell them how they can see Kate's incredible animations. Many of you have already been so generous with your philanthropic gifts this year, but if you are inspired to donate before the silly season, please do so. Your money will go to the incredible medical research of the Garvin Institute. Um, always a privilege to be with you. Uh, stay safe, stay, stay well, and on behalf of everyone at Garvin, we wish you and your families a healthy, safe and enjoyable festive season. See you in 2021, if not before. Thanks, Kate. Thank you.